So visible audible? Yes, sir, both. So well, good evening, everyone, and I would uh, thank Merck and uh, uh, especially Dr. Heyman for uh, uh, keeping me enrolled in scientific meets and providing me the opportunity and to speak in front of my uh, 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 my colleagues and my friends. So, uh, so I think we have heard of this presentation multiple times. It will be just a revision of what we know. So, uh, uh, what is the standard first line uh, uh, treatment of uh, recurrent metastatic squamous cell uh, head neck cancer. What is the current clinical evidence we have? How can we take this clinical trial data to practice? Uh, what are the finer, uh, if we do finer dissections, what we can understand from these trials is what I'll speak in coming 15 20 minutes. So, well, if we look into uh, the head neck cancer, we are all used to treat head neck cancer in uh, large volumes. And what we have seen is, uh, if you look into the Indian setting, the proportion of oral cavity cancers are far higher uh, than that of the oral cavity cancers of West. Uh, uh, in West, we see more of oropharyngeal cancers and so, but we can see one third of uh, lip oral cavity cancer patients are in India. So one third of the whole chunk of world population for oral cavity is basically from India. So. One more thing, what we can note is uh, the difference between incidence and mortality. So uh, somehow uh, we are picking up disease at a little advanced stage when compared to the West. Therefore, there is a little higher mortality conversion uh, in our setting when compared to West, just because we're picking it a little later. So if you look into our own data from uh, TMH, there was some, uh, they studied a retrospective analysis of uh, 5,000 odd patients. So, uh, what they found was that 90% of patients did present with stage 3 and stage 4 disease. So even we have seen in our clinics that uh, there is always a debate whether NACT to be given first or surgery is possible. So we are majority of patients do present with these uh, technically unresectable or difficult to resect uh, cancers. So this is because of the refractoriness in presenting early. So and uh, also what we have noted is that uh, Indian uh, uh, population present little early uh, than the rest of the world. So younger patients, much uh, locally advanced disease are the ones that uh, present to us uh, than that of uh, Western world. So large and advanced tumors need a therapy that are that, that require rapid debulking and early relief. So uh, we have seen in oncology where response rates do not actually translate to overall survival or quality of life. So uh, but uh, because of the mere uh, location of this disease, because it is head and neck location, uh, if you have tongue cancer, it is required for speaking, swallowing, chewing. Uh, at times, if it is large, it also intervenes with breathing aspiration. So because of the mere location, so response rate becomes an important criteria in head neck cancer. The pain, quality of life, uh, uh, directly proportional to shrinkage of tumor. So this is one area where response rate becomes important uh, when in contrast to ovarian cancer or a colon cancer where response rate is not that important. So, uh, so uh, Indian population differ from Western population in that uh, we are basically tobacco driven, uh, whereas in the West it is mainly HPV driven. So uh, uh, this difference in etiology exists when the etiology is different the age, the site of disease, which is more oral cavity, uh, and the molecular biology is also different. So oral cavity is more common below 40 years of age group, whereas oropharynx and larynx are really common above 40 years of age. Uh, so then this is another slide which is saying that head and neck cancer means nearly 60% are oral cavity cancer in India, and lesser percentages are larynx, hypopharynx, and oropharynx. So for us, head and neck cancer means we always think of oral cavity cancers in contrast to the West where laryngeal cancers uh, are, are in a significantly higher proportion. So when we treat uh, head and neck cancer, what are our targets? So of course, prolonging overall survival is an extremely important target. But along with that, response rate becomes important, especially in this particular subset of patients where response rate actually translate to better quality of life. 
So uh, uh, rapid response rate, uh, debulking or uh, reducing the disease burden, causing symptomatic relief is extremely important when you come to head and neck cancers. So other criteria we think of is can the patient take a 5-FU pump uh, who is recurrent metastatic with a large uh, oral cavity mass and is he a candidate for cisplatin? All these things come into mind uh, when we have to uh, offer treatment to a uh, locally advanced or recurrent metastatic head neck cancer. So each patient is unique and personalizing care is important before we select the uh, treatment regimen. So uh, we didn't have uh, so chemotherapy basically did not uh, show a significant overall survival benefit. It did show a benefit in terms of response rates, PFS, but uh, this was the first in its sort where uh, extreme trial where uh, in this particular uh, randomized trial where there was uh, 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 platinum sensitive recurrent metastatic head neck patients, head neck cancer patients were randomized to chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus cetuximab, and cetuximab was continued until disease progression. Chemotherapy they used was 100 milligram per meter square of this platin on day one, or cover platin AUC5 on day one, and 5-FU was 1,000 milligram per meter square day one to day four, continuous infusion, and this was uh, every three weeks for up to six cycles. So we know how difficult it is to give uh, TPF or cisplatin 5-FU in uh, real world. So we usually do this in a, a new adjuvant setting, but in metastatic setting, we know how difficult it is to manage. And cetuximab, uh, as we all know, 400 uh, followed by 250 weekly. So the primary endpoint was overall survival in this particular trial. Secondary endpoints were progression-free overall response rate, disease control rate, duration of response, and so on. So this uh, trial was a positive trial. At five-year follow-up, uh, this trial showed a statistically significant overall survival benefit 10.1 million overall survival versus 7.4 months. Hazard ratio 0.8, p-value 0 0.04, statistically significant. So this led uh, for the extreme regimen becoming the standard of care for recurrent metastatic platinum sensitive head neck cancers. So if you look into the subgroup, oral cavity had 88 patients and you can see uh, uh, the benefit is again in the cetuximab side. So even in oral cavity cancer, cetuximab is extremely effective if you look into the final uh, details of the extreme trial. So uh, because extreme trial had uh, five of you infusion for four days, which was cumbersome to practice in metastatic patients, then uh, came up this TP extreme or the GOTEC 2014 trial. This is a phase two uh, uh, randomized trial uh, uh, comparing the extreme regimen uh, with, uh, with cetuximab, uh, 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 cisplatin and docetaxel, where taxin came in place of IFU and a mandatory GCSF was used. So you can look into the dose of cisplatin, which is 75 milligram per meter square in contrast to 100 milligram per meter square uh, in the extreme regimen. And docetaxel was 75 per meter square as we use. Uh, and the number of chemotherapy cycles was only four. And you can also see the cetuximab maintenance arm it was weekly uh, in the extreme arm, and it was two weekly in the cetuximab arm, uh, in the TP extreme arm. So the uh, the differences between extreme and TP extreme was that uh, the continuous four day infusional 5FU was not there. The number of chemo cycles were four in the TP extreme, and two weekly cetuximab maintenance, where you can reduce the frequency of visits, uh, was there, and cisplatin dose was less. So this was the comparison, and if you look into the overall response rates uh, in TPX and extreme, it's comparable 57 59%, nearly 60% response rates. And the rates of progressive disease are so less, 8 versus 11%, and the median overall survival is comparable. And we had an overall survival of 14.5 months in the TPX. So most importantly, uh, 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 TP extreme was a single day infusion. Taxin was used, no 5FU. And the grade four adverse events were significantly less. The duration of chemotherapy exposure was just for four cycles. And the percentage of patients who completed the planned cycles were nearly 72%. And the major contraindications for uh, polytoxicity with uh, 5FU was not of concern in the TP extreme arm. So uh, maintenance uh, cetuximab was weekly versus two weekly. So then we had uh, the Keynote 048 where immunotherapy came up in the frontline setting. 
you look into uh, the details the similar uh, inclusion criteria and the randomization was uh, one is to one is to one pembro monotherapy pembro chemo and the extreme regimen so the chemotherapy arm was just like a uh, extreme uh, uh, cisplatin or carboplatin 5fu 5fu was used as a four day infusion and it was up to six cycles and cetuximab was just like a extreme uh, arm which was used weekly so we had pembro mono pembro chemo and extreme so uh, the study met its primary end point where if you look into the indian to treat population pembro mono therapy uh, uh, did not show superior os over extreme in the indian to treat population if you look into pembro mono versus extreme there was no overall survival benefit so you can see 11.5 versus 10.7 months and the hazard ratio was 0.83 and the p value was not statistically significant so what most importantly you can look into is the criss crossing of curves so this simply means that uh, uh, if you look into the in io arm there is an initial deterioration uh, nearly 40% 50% patients do progress and they don't respond to io and then uh, whoever responds they are going to respond longer so this criss crossing happens when we lack a proper biomarker you can see the blue one uh, uh, just lies down where the progression number of people progressing uh, in the initial 2 months uh, are quite high and those patients who benefit are the ones who benefit long so it looks like uh, from this criss crossing of curves that it is uh, that small subgroup of around uh, 30 40% population uh, who benefit are the ones who benefit the most so that small subset of population for example here the biomarker they have used is cps more than 20 so it is basically this small subset of uh, 30 40% patients who are trying to pull the curve towards uh, a benefit towards the pembro mono therapy so uh, yes pembro mono uh, in uh, uh, in a subset where cps more than 20 does show overall survival benefit but you, need, you must remember that you will have around 40% patients progressing on pembro mono so we have a cps more than 20 is a excellent biomarker but not that great even uh, some patients do progress on pembro mono even if cps is more than 20 so whereas pembro chemo uh, uh, did sh- did did show an improvement in median overall survival of 13 versus 10.7 uh, with a good hazard ratio of 0.77 with p value of 0.0034 uh and uh, the benefit was much better in those where the cps is more than 1 and cps more than 20 so this is a uh, important uh, representation where what we must look into is whether it's pembro mono arm or pembro chemo arm the number of patients who have disease progression is quite important if you look into the right la- last uh, column in the intent to treat if i am using pembro mono randomly uh, i have 40% patients who are going to have disease progression and even if cps is more than 20 i have 32% patients who have disease progression so the the whole problem with io is i don't know whether the patient will belong to this uh, uh, 30 30% or the 70% arm so the risk of disease progression is an issue with io uh, but if they benefit they're going to benefit long so we don't know who so the so it boils down to that we don't have that great biomarker to select io even till date so if i use uh, pembro chemo even there there is almost uh, double the number of patients who have disease progression on pembro chemo so the study absolutely met its primary end point with the caveat that uh, the number of patients who have disease progression are significantly higher when compared to the extreme regimen be it uh, 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 B C C P S low or C P S high, they did have disease progression, whether pembro or pembro uh, chemo arm, uh, uh, and also the overall survival benefit. What we have seen is totally driven by the population who had C P S more than twenty. So C P S more than twenty, we can agree that it is a good biomarker for pembro mono or pembro chemo. But for that less than twenty, uh, uh, there is an issue because. probably the benefit was driven by those patients who actually benefited so then we had some evidence uh, from our own uh, institute comparing ivc statin versus oral metronomic which was non inferior and then we had some real world evidences from uh, the 
regarding cetuximab usage. So this was a retrospective study of 229 patients. So they did have, uh, they did use cetuximab uh, with various combinations uh, like with Paclicarbo, Cis5FU or methotrexate and so on. However, Paclicarbo was the predominant regimen they used. And this again re-strengthened the evidence that there is an improvement in overall survival uh, when you use cetuximab. So there is an improvement in overall survival progression free survival, survival with the statistic with statistically significant p values and you can see the response rates of around 77% so cetuximab uh, addition to chemotherapy and in this particular trial they continued cetuximab uh, and they changed the chemotherapy arm this we did with do with trastuzumab so continuing cetuximab uh, uh, really uh, showed significant benefit in terms of uh, improved response rates, progression-free survival, and overall survival in this particular data. So then we had our own paper, uh, for a small study, uh, a retrospective study of the prospectively maintained data, uh, where we used this, the first in its sort, where we used sequential uh, TP extreme regimen, Pakli Carbocetuximab weekly, followed by nivolumab. So this was one of the first sequencing data from uh, India. So if you can use this, uh, we had a response rate approaching nearly 80%. And uh, on those patients where we could use nivolumab in subsequent lines, we met our overall survival of 20.4 months. Even though the number of patients were less, uh, so we, uh, uh, we we spoke with Dr. Rajit, uh, who is in Dhamshil and Arayana, and so we compiled the data and looked like if we can use TP extreme frontline followed by Nivolumab, we can uh, go up to an overall survival of 20 months. So later on, there were uh, there was another uh, study where even they also showed if I can use TP extreme first followed by uh, IO in the subsequent line, we can achieve an excellent overall survival of 20 months, which was never heard of in uh, head neck cancer. So then this was another trial from China where they showed that giving uh, cetuximab beyond 11 cycles versus less than 11 cycles, it was different. So Continuing cetuximab did benefit uh, in terms of OS and PFS. So, well, uh, to come to the conclusion, so uh, the head neck cancer, what we see uh, in our setting is completely different from Western world. What we see in clinical trial uh, is what is known as lead time bias. So, in clinical trial, we pick up metastatic patients on imaging. So, we had an adjuvant trial. We kept on imaging. We picked up a small lung nodule and we made it metastatic and we try to treat these patients. So definitely clinical trial patients or uh, patients in the Western world have a lesser disease burden when compared to our real world patients because 90% uh, of them present with stage three or stage four disease with a bulky neck node, a large oral cavity masses. So when, when the disease bulk is larger and is, uh, uh, response rate becomes an important criteria, especially in our setting. So a response rate is directly proportional to improvement in quality of life because the organs involved in uh, head neck are required for uh, uh, vital actions uh, like chewing, swallowing, speaking, uh, uh, and, and also prevent, preventing aspiration and so on. So response rate becomes an important criteria, especially in our setting. And we cannot afford 40% of patients to progress on our frontline therapy. So yes, we have uh, uh, the keynote trial where, uh, where, where, where uh, in, in Pembro chemo did have uh, an overall survival improvement when compared to the extreme regimen in the Indian to treat population. But if you finally look into the uh, trial, it was basically the CPS more than 20 uh, that drove the whole advantage towards the IO arm. So, uh, so if, if I'm using IO in the front line, I will have a fear of 30 to 40% patients actually progressing. Uh, and this is the problem until we have the biomarker. So CPS 20, even in CPS 20, we could see uh, if I use Pembro Mono, I have 30% uh, patients having disease progression. So uh, in, in, in my opinion, yes, uh, uh, Pembro chemo should be an option where there is non-bulky disease. I have CPS more than 20. But if I have a bulky disease uh, uh, where response rate becomes important, where I cannot afford disease progression in those patients, uh, I would uh, prefer a TP extreme regimen or an extreme regimen over uh, a Pembro monotherapy. So also the difficulty of using uh, continuous infusion by a few is also an issue. 
so with this uh, i would conclude uh, my uh, talk and i would thank the organizers for providing the opportunity and back to you uh,